First of all, I'd like to thank Jason and Robert and the ASGE for this opportunity to present at this inaugural virtual ASGE postgraduate course. My disclosure. So let's start with terminology. You've probably seen the term water immersion and water exchange. They are very different. Now both use water infusion by a water pump during insertion of the colonoscope to the cecum. But with water immersion, we leave the gas on. You can insufflate gas, ideally it should be CO2, as an option if you think it will help you get to the cecum. You infuse the water to assist progression to the cecum. So this is using water as an aid really to conventional colonoscopy. Water exchange is different. Here we turn the gas off and we are only infusing water. We wanna aspirate all gas pockets. We wanna get all the bubbles out, any residual pockets. And we wanna also aspirate any contaminated uh, contents. We will infuse water to maintain a clear view of the lumen. So when I use water exchange, my foot is on the water pump pedal pretty much the entire time. And I'm constantly aspirating contents. So I keep the lumen just distended enough so that I can see, but I'm doing a recycling of the old dirty water for the new clean water. Those of us who have been scuba diving or snorkeling know the advantages of underwater imaging. You get these magnificent views underwater. A lot of it is the magnification effect. It's 1.33 fold, but also the images are crisp clear and so color intense as you can see here. I call water the do-it-yourself magnifying glass. It's the poor man's magnifying glass. There's no light reflection artifact and that can cause a lot of confusion when you're using gas and impede your visualization of fine detail. There's no fogging and you get this 3D floating effect. And this is really I think the key advantage of underwater, and that led me to using it for underwater EMR. So here you see an example with gas, you get this light reflection artifact here and underwater it's gone. And so you can see the fine detail. This is a SSA here. You can see the fine detail. Video capsule endoscopy is an underwater imaging procedure. That explains why we have, despite a very primitive CMOS chip, these beautiful images showing the villi standing on top of this fold like the teeth on a comb. And this is from 2001, one of my very first capsule endoscopy procedures. And I'm just mesmerized at the detail when we view this underwater. And that's the natural environment of the small bowel. It's filled usually with fluid. Each of these images in the esophagus, the stomach, small bowel, the colon, these are all underwater images. And that is why we have likened capsule endoscopy to that fantastic voyage of a submarine submerged in water traveling through the length of the GI tract. We get this 3D floating effect. It can be quite remarkable at times. Here with the gas view, you see a lesion that looks fairly flat. And after water submersion, it's floating upwards and you can see the individual villi, even see the vascular pattern of these villi. So the villi here are just collapsed and they've been flattened by the gas distension. Sometimes we can discover polyps that may be hidden in caves such as the appendiceal orifice. Here's the gas view, here's the water view. And in this video, you'll see that after infusing water into the lumen, we still see the AO here, but as we watch the AO now underwater, the lumen contracts and this polyp crawls out of its cave and exposes itself to our view. Often these AO lesions are SSAs and so they are very flat. So underwater imaging with its floating effect facilitates identification 
of these flat polyps. Several randomized controlled trials have shown that underwater colonoscopy improves the Boston Bowel Preparation Score. This is not surprising because we are using the water jet like a hose and we're washing off the surface here. Here you can see this adherent brownish mucus, it's fecal residue, but we can wash it off of the surface to expose the underlying mucosa. And this is so important to identify SSAs because they too can produce a mucus cap. So it really isn't surprising that many studies, randomized controlled, have shown that the ADR, the adenoma detection rate, is significantly higher using the underwater method. We also can use the water jet to interrogate tissue. So here you can see a polyp growing along a fold and extending more proximally. Now it floats into the lumen after water submersion, but we are interfacing with this lesion using the water jet to move the villus components around and to look in the valleys between the hills of the villi here. So it can be very helpful to identify pathology, especially in a depressed lesion. EUS is an underwater imaging procedure. We focus on the ultrasound, so we don't think of it as an underwater procedure, but we need water for the acoustic coupling to the bowel wall. So we submerge the lumen, and this is a video from a time when I staged a lesion in the colon, and I noted looking simultaneously at the endoscopic and the ultrasound view that although the lumen was contracted, the muscularis propria stays round on the outside. And the bowel wall retains its native thickness. Normally the thickness is somewhere between four and five millimeters. When you distend the wall with gas, it reduces to about a third of that thickness to maybe two or three millimeters. So essentially we are converting a flat lesion seen here with the gas view, a Paris 2A type lesion to an elevated lesion, a Paris 1S lesion, as if we had injected in the submucosa to raise it up. So why is it that we get this floating effect? Well, it is the anti-gravity effect of water, but the submucosa contains a large amount of fat. The radiologists see that in the submucosa, they call this the black halo sign. And on EUS, that third layer, the submucosa contains fat. And that is why it is bright, echogenic. You can see here the yellowish fat tissue in the submucosa after performing EMR. So this led to development of the UEMR method. The gas view, another example, appears Paris 2A, very flat here, with the lumen quite distended with gas. After infusing water, water submersion, we get the underwater view. The lumen's contracted, it's raised. So now we can easily lasso this raised lesion as if we had injected submucosally and perform on block resection with one ensnarement. You can see the appearance afterwards. This is the lesion that was growing along a fold. But let's step back for a moment. Why do we even inject before we perform EMR? What's the rationale for that? Why do we do it? Well, it's conceptual. When we insufflate with gas, we distend and thin the wall and we will flatten the lesion. So to counter that effect, we perform submucosal injection to facilitate lesion capture because it's been flattened by the gas, to reduce the risk of perforation and a transmural burn because the wall is so much thinner. So that's the conceptual rationale for the submucosal injection. And yet there are no data to support submucosal injection as beneficial or improving safety. There's just this one animal study that's always quoted, six swine, and that doesn't come close to proving 
that submucosal injection decreases thermal injury to the deeper wall layers. In fact, using the hot biopsy forceps, there was no significant difference. Compared to using APC, there was a deeper burn when we have learned that APC is supposed to limit the burn to the superficial layer. When we go underwater, the lumen is contracted. This allows us to retain the native wall thickness, its consistency, its compliance, and the layers separate from one another, and allows us to capture a larger surface area. So our on-block resection rate can increase. And this is demonstrated in this video. You see a large LST. It's multi-lobulated. It's a 1S to a lesion close to the appendiceal orifice and the cecum. And we start with the gas view. It's about four centimeters in size. And if you were to resect this using conventional EMR method, it would definitely have to be piecemeal. I think all would agree with that. So now we're going to evacuate the gas and we're gonna replace it with water, with saline. We're using always saline. So now the lesion floats up, the lumen contracts. So it's occupying a much lesser surface area and it allows us using a 33 millimeter oval snare to completely encompass the circumference of the lesion on the outer margins of the lesion and then apply cautery and perform on block resection. So here you see the appearance after the resection, no bleeding. The layer of resection is more superficial. It's not as close to the muscularis propria as when you perform conventional EMR. So it's in the SM2 layer. And here you can see the scarring after the lesion on follow-up. So what can water immersion add to your practice? Well, it will improve the prep. And this in turn will improve the ADR. The better your prep, the higher the ADR. It may assist with difficult intubation. And why is that? It's, there's less distension. And this in turn leads to less looping. It may lower your recurrence rates. Historically, recurrence rates have been in the order of 20 to 25%, some even as high as 50%. The recurrence rates with UEMR are generally below 10%. It may assist resection of recurrent or scarred and defiant polyps, polyps in difficult locations like the IC valve, the appendiceal orifice, but most importantly, enjoy the underwater view. Thank you very much.